Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you live from these United States of America here in Des Moines, Iowa, where we both work at Mercy College of Health Sciences, the Senior Advisor for Mission Initiatives, and the Director of the Center for Human Flourishing over here in, in, in the Bo Chair, in the Bud <laughs> Chair. What is it you do for the old college? I'm the Associate Provost there at Mercy College of Health Sciences. That's right. So he is very associative. He makes people associate... I don't know what it means to provosticate. I don't, is there a verb form of provost? Uh, provoke? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm. I'm starting to wonder about like the um, the more prevalent use of associate these days. And I, I don't think it's fair, but I think when we use the word assistant, like folks got a little testy about that. Like, you know, my job is to assist someone, but really I do assist the provost. So I would have been fine with assistant, but associate works. That's right. That's right. I like that. Uh, this is pure radio gold here, right? We're just like <laughs> setting up lobs for each other back and forth. Mercy College of Health Science sets up the ability for this show to happen. They underwrite our show. Thank you, Mercy College, for doing so. MCHS.edu here in the middle of September. But we got a lot of stuff uh in progress, but because of our uh, diversified ways uh, that people can actually get a degree at Mercy College of Health Sciences, there's always time to look forward to uh, the next start. So I know we have a few of them um, coming up here that you don't have to wait till January to look into. Yeah, and you know, sometimes, Bo, we do have a history at Mercy College of being a place that trained nurses. The Sisters of Mercy did that for a long time. But sometimes, like in the grocery store or at a barbecue, someone will say, like, oh, the nursing school. And we're more than a nursing school. I mean, a lot of great nurses there, but public health, healthcare administration, uh, sonography, all sorts of things. Absolutely. So mchs.edu, where you can go check out our programs and look at ways in which you can get your health career started, multiple paths into a health career. And then, of course, we would love to have you back to keep training, keep getting those certificates and degrees to progress in your career. So thank you, Mercy College, MCHS. Dot edu. But uh, football has started in earnest. One of the ways that you know this is um, there's just a lot of fantasy football drafts oh, that yeah. my wife happens to notice now that I'm a part of. Now, luckily, I was um, I was actually not in town when I did, I think, at least one of them. But uh, I just wonder if, you know, do, do you hear it when you're you're trying to have to defend yourself being a grown man uh, doing fantasy football drafts? Well, Rachel's very gracious with this. Um, I do have to say, this year, my high school buddies reached out to me very great, you know, generously and, and invited me to join their league. And I did have the wherewithal to decline because I've got college friends, graduate school friends, neighborhood friends, Des Moines area friends. So five drafts would have been... A little much. Now, let's be honest. Like you, you, you seem like you're generous with your time, but actually, you're just trying to increase your odds to actually win one of these things. Well, I don't think it matters how many fantasy football leagues I join. I do not win. I don't know. <laughs> For how much of my life I've spent watching football, you think I could perform better? <laughs> this year, it's going to be a really big letdown because Yahoo rated my most important league, rated my draft as an A, and said like I had the best selection in the league, and I'll still finish in last place. Well, you can frame that. You know, that's uh, that they they allow you to print that page off. It's like people come into the house. What's that certificate for? Oh, fantasy football. You won your league. No, no, I, I had the, the highest graded draft. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, speaking of uh, draft, this is a bad transition. What's no longer in draft form is the Labor Day statement from the USCCB. The Most Reverend Paul S. Coakley, Archbishop of Oklahoma City. From Oklahoma, so you know it's better than most other statements, bud. Uh, I can say so as an Oki. Uh, but very timely. We just got done celebrating Labor Day. Labor Day is more than just, of course, cookouts and barbecue, although we can talk about whether we did a good job with that or not. But this statement from the USCCB, very relevant and prescient to our show, so I figure talking about a dream for a better economy, like you said, was uh, you suggested this, is uh, perfect for our show. So that's what we're going to talk about today when we get back from the break. The Labor Day Statement from the USCCB by the Most Reverend Paul S. Coakley, Archbishop of Oklahoma City. This is The Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr. Stick around, and we'll be back here on Iowa Catholic Radio right after this. 
St. Vincent de Paul's assists those living in poverty to become self-sufficient. Learn more at svdpsm.org or call 515-282-8327. This message brought to you by Homemakers Furniture. The next Man Up West Power Lunch is Friday, September 10th at noon, St. Francis of Assisi Parish in West Des Moines. There will be a panel of newly ordained priests sharing their vocation story. Lunch will be provided by the West Des Moines Chick-fil-A on University. Learn more at iowacatholicradio.com under the events section. Are you a Catholic who wants to fall deeper in love with Christ and His Church? Do you want to learn more about how you fit into the greatest love story in the history of the world? Do you want to be strengthened in your understanding of our Church's teachings? Have you ever wondered how the Catechism can be a resource and an enrichment to your faith? If you answer yes to any of these questions, then the Catechetical Institute is for you. Find out more by visiting our website at faithjourneyci.com or call John at 515 515- 237-5006. Mary's Meals provides hope in the form of one good meal to over one million of the world's poorest children every school day. Learn more about Mary's Meals at Mary's Meals USA.org. Mary's Meals, a simple solution to world hunger. Mary's Meals USA.org. Thank you, Ashworth Vision Clinic, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365 on Iowa Catholic Radio. Ashworth Vision Clinic online at ashworthvision.com. Ashworth Vision Clinic, 515-440-4610. Thank you, Dental Associates, for supporting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams, 515-225-6742. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Back with the Uncommon Good Thank you for joining our show here on Iowa Catholic Radio. If you want to keep up with what Iowa Catholic Radio is doing, it's easy to do so. You can go to iowacatholicradio.com where you can listen live, donate, sign up for newsletters. You can join us on Facebook, Iowa Catholic Radio, to become our friends. Go to Twitter and do at IA Catholic Radio to follow our tweets. And also you can download the Iowa Catholic Radio app. And anywhere you have data, you can listen live, listen to pre-recorded shows. You can uh, donate there as well. And just keep up with everything we're doing here on Iowa Catholic Radio and in and around the Diocese of Des Moines. But today, uh, by your suggestion, we're going to talk about the Labor Day Statement from the USCCB. The, from, uh, so Most Reverend uh, Paul S. Coakley, Archbishop of Oklahoma City. Uh, great prelate. I, I've met him, know, him uh, know people who work for him. And I think that he, uh, as the chairman of the Committee on Domestic Justice and Human Development, did everybody a service uh, by putting this out on Labor Day. Labor Day for most of us, but I think, you know, not improperly so, is a day of leisure. And I think a lot of us think about um, cooking out, being with the family, things like this. I got to say, um, I made, uh, and just as objectively as possible about my own food, some of the most delicious mushroom Swiss burgers that, that oh, anyone wow. has really had in a while. But all that said, involved red wine even, but <laughs> red wine on Labor Day. Uh, on the grill, but suffice it to say, we're not going to have an entire show about how great our Labor Day uh, cookouts were, um, because there is, of course, uh, a reason for the season. I know we usually say that about Christmas, but Labor Day itself has a reason that maybe some people don't often understand, and I think the statement um, sets the stage, especially uh, with the issues that we're grappling with uh, in our day and time. I, I like the fact, Bo, that Archbishop Coakley in this letter, he actually goes out of his way to thank laborers. When you and I taught servant leadership at Mercy College, we would introduce the students to Aristotle. And Aristotle famously defines human beings as rational animals. He says what sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom? It's really that our intellect can control our passions. But when we got into that text, we'd bring into view uh, the contribution of a living Catholic philosopher, Alistair McIntyre, who added a qualifier, so he said, we're not simply rational animals, we're dependent rational animals. And we tried to point out to the students, you know, we're sitting in a clean classroom with electricity, you know, and we're sort of expecting everything to be working and functioning well. How did we get to this point? Well, there's all sorts of contributions from different members of our society. I mean, as a kind of silly aside... I was thinking about this on Saturday because I got stuck in an elevator. Oh, oh yeah. So a, I was disappointed. Yeah, a, I was disappointed that the elevator stopped working, but b, I was very grateful that the fire department showed up like within thirty minutes because I didn't know how long I would last in there. Not 
oxygen wise, but psychologically. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it's good for us to remind ourselves of that. Like weirdly in our society, uh, you know, and I'm as guilty of this as the next person, we sort of invert who we honor, <laughs> you know, like I, I love watching sports. And so we'll like, re- we'll really glorify um, a receiver who can do amazing things on the football field, but forget about um, the, the welder, the, um, the farmhand, like on down the line, the kinds of people who without them, we wouldn't uh, survive on a weekly basis. So I was happy to see that in Archbishop Coakley's letter. Absolutely. And like you said, uh, out of the gate, basically the second paragraph, on this Labor Day I express my gratitude to the many workers who have kept our country functioning during these trying times, specifically with the COVID outbreak, and worked under difficult and often underappreciated conditions. And he goes on to talk about how many people um, had lack of resources uh, or income, you know, people who lost jobs, everything that goes into that. But I do think it's important for us to stop and be very thankful and allow uh, the sort of eyes of faith to inform us that a lot of what we just assume goes on as we walk around this world is actually done by a whole host of people that, as you said, I don't know how, another way to say this, but just by pay scale, bud, we show that we don't necessarily honor their contributions um, as much as other people, but I think it's frank to say, as much as they're worth. When it came down to it and the nation locked down, there were very essential workers that maybe a year before no one would have called an essential worker. How many people, bud, do you think would go, oh, the person's stocking food in a grocery store is an essential worker or, you know, a janitor? Like, I mean, I'm being honest like that. I don't know if people would say that derisively, but they wouldn't think that. And now all of a sudden it comes into plain view that these workers on the front lines, those are frontline workers. Of course, nurses are frontline workers and police and firefighters, but people who make the economy run uh, a much wider group of people than I think we allow ourselves to usually think about. And so now, but here we are all these months into the pandemic and still going on navigating all these things. And of course, I know one of the things people see in the news is Uh, lack of workers, like are we going to be able to hire people back, and this is a big discussion. Uh, But I'm hoping once again that that allows people to say, really, the the people that we we often, too often, consider at the quote-unquote bottom of the wage food chain are people that we depend on so much that we forget about them. It's sort of, you know, the old adage about how people uh, forget about thanking their mom and dad because their love and support is just so assumed. And I think that that's one of the things that Archbishop Coakley leads with, is a lot of our daily lives, we just assume is going to be there, Mm -hmm. and that's because people do those jobs. Yeah, he points out in a couple ways, uh, you know, things that were good for me to hear that I didn't fully realize, I think, where Archbishop Coakley at different points in the letter mentions so 47% of their pe- of Americans lost some portion of their income during the pandemic. So half of us experienced some sort of uh, loss in that regard. And even though it feels in many ways like we've had a recovery, uh, we still, he points out, the numbers of unemployment are higher than they were uh, before February 2020. So still some very like prescient issues that I think as a country we need to deal with. But Archbishop Coakley picks up an important theme from Pope Francis, and that's uh, getting back to the question of, after this is over, he says, do we really want to necessarily go back just to the way things were before? And one phrase that um, that His Excellency uses that I think is good for us to keep in mind is this idea of feverish consumerism. Because mm-hmm. when we talk about the economy, we talk about productivity, we can devolve into this, like, well, isn't it just important that we're producing things and buying them? Uh, well, you know, there's there's a lot deeper, broader questions that we have to face. And one I think, Bo, is, um, so how do I get at this? Uh, You know, sometimes when we talk about what the church has to say about work or the economy, folks will say, like, is this really the church's business? Like, we sort of associate certain ideas with the church. And, um, you know, a central kind of concern for Catholic leaders in recent years, and rightly so, is family and then the protection of human life. And wouldn't you say, like, in many ways this whole issue is wrapped up with that? If we want to encourage young people to branch out and to have families and to embrace that vocation. If we want to encourage folks in difficult situations to welcome life into the world, 
You know, the question of a living wage and just work automatically enters into those sorts of conversations. Absolutely. And I think that uh, to your point, like, so the feverish consumerism, forms of selfish self-protection, selfish self-protection is quite a phrase in English, (laughs) by the way. Um, So, you know, the Archbishop points out that Pope Francis promotes promotes a new ethos around economic thinking, one that is not ideological, which moves beyond, this is quoting now, the polarization of free market capitalism and state socialism, and which has at its heart a concern that all humanity have access to land, lodging, and labor. I think that that is exactly the, the, the point, but it's like there's plenty in the news that talks about pro-life issues, that talks about families, and we're all rightly worried about how the family fits in to on the stage of the modern world. And Archbishop Coakley, and again, I want to point out, no one's idea of a sort of liberal prelate in any <laughs> sort of idea loves the liturgy known for... Um, standing up uh, for the, 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 the strict understanding of, of tradition and the faith. Uh, but that's what he's getting at, is to say it's traditional to say that we can't think of the economy first and foremost as a matter of efficiency, of breakneck efficiency, of self-sufficiency even. But what are we going to do to make the first thought about the economy be about families, children, and people who are vulnerable? And uh, to read into this, uh, just because, again, I myself am an Oki, and I know um, one of the big events in Archbishop Coakley's uh, career as an archbishop there is, uh, the, you know, Stanley Rother being uh, America's first, you know, recognized martyr, and they're making the Stanley Rother Shrine down in Oklahoma City. It's very beautiful. But exactly Father Rother's uh, willingness to go uh, die for the sake of his sheep had, it, but, you know, he was just a farm kid, and that's one of the things he did uh, was he loved his people because he wanted to make sure that they could have families and live a life in a very turbulent situation. And so we extrapolate that dear, here today. We have another turbulent situation. We have a a, a, a economy that's a throwaway economy. Yeah. So what are we going to do, like you said, in order to make that um, permanent and, and, and believe in the sort of first things and the lasting things? Yeah, that phrase, throwaway economy, the Holy Fathers used that one. We've got a good friend, Charlie Camosi, who's written a great book about that. But it really is, that language is meant to remind us that this is all interrelated and integrally related. The way that we we care for the poor and the least of these, uh, the way that we think about labor and just wages, and then our protection of human life from conception until natural death, all of those things, it's it's a web of interconnections. Yes, uh, and, and I think that one of the things that's interesting is the more you look into uh, what the Archbishop starts to point out is, you know, it's like you said, there's just so many phrases that he picks up from Pope Francis that, um, I, I mean, i got to be honest, sometimes Pope Francis writes <laughs> extremely long uh, works that are hard to maybe, like, expect someone to read all of them. So I think uh, Archbishop Coakley does a good job of really picking out, like you said, phrases that pop. So um, all those places where the church is present, especially our parishes and our communities, may become islands of mercy in the midst of the sea of indifference. And I think that that's when we get back from the break, we'll talk about that. What does it mean to be an island of mercy in a sea of indifference? So this is the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Mars. Stick around, and we'll be back right after this. Thank you, Big Red Q Quick Print, for underwriting the sports report. Family owned and operated since 1980, Big Red Q Quick Print is a full service print shop, ready to help you with all your printing needs with speed and accuracy. BigRedQ-DesMoines.com. What is the best gift ever? Giving a Catholic education is at the top of my list. Your contribution to CTO helps families send their children to our Catholic schools who otherwise could not afford it. In giving to CTO, You receive the best tax credits ever. Pledge or donate online at ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Thank you, Golden Rule Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling, for sponsoring my show, John Lee and Eddie in the Morning on Iowa Catholic Radio. Golden Rule, servicing Des Moines for over 15 years. They obey the rules to live by, especially the Golden Rule. Online at goldenrulephc.com. The Iowa Catholic Radio Network is supported by our listeners and business underwriters. Today, we welcome a new underwriter, Northwest Bank, offering a variety of financial services, including mortgage, wealth management, 
and insurance on the web at nw.bank. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by Mary's Cleaning Care. Mary's Cleaning Care cleans everything from residential to commercial in Des Moines and surrounding areas. Mary'sCleaningCare.com. Thank you, Mary's Cleaning Care, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Thank you for listening to the show. We love having you be a part of our considerations here on The Uncommon Good. But today we are talking about uh, the Labor Day Statement from the USCCB, A Dream for a Better Economy. Most Reverend Paul S. Coakley, Archbishop of Oklahoma City, and therefore coming from Oklahoma, it's great. So says me in Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, no, but we, we've had a, a, a wonderful... Uh, in you know, get, getting into the meat of like why this is so timely, especially on Labor Day, uh, we left off the segment um, before the break, saying what we need to be is an island of mercy and a sea of indifference. So, Archbishop ends this letter talking about going forward. What are we going to do? How are we going to uh, live this life different? He quotes uh, James uh, chapter two. St. James never minces words, uh, so he tells us that we become judges with evil designs when we remain distant from the poor. So, Bud, that idea that going forward, what we have to do is not remain distant from the poor, that, you know, Pope Francis thinks that we ignore some of the aspects of what a Catholic economy should look like because of our distance from the poor, and some of that being self-motivated. Um, I, I think that's probably the best way to, to end the segment here is, is imagining what that means practically for us to not be distanced from the poor then. Yeah, I think sometimes when the church has the boldness to speak to these issues, folks hear this and it, it can come off as, again, we refract a lot of this conversation through partisan political lens. So it says like, oh, is the church siding with this group or that group? When uh, really I think the key bow is to learn to think about these things well. Like we have to address them. So how do we do them? in a way that's scriptural and traditional. And you mentioned James, too. It's funny how the more things change, the more they stay the same, because St. James is already dealing in Christian communities with folks who are showing favoritism, and they say, like, you know, someone comes in with fine robes and a nice ring, and you give them the best seat. And James says that's, that shouldn't be so. And it's, I mean, I don't know, this still rings true today. Listen, dear brethren, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. And then I love this part. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? So I know we're running close to the end of the show, and maybe we can circle back to these topics some other time this fall. But I, I think, like as we've always said on the show, you and I don't have the uh, silver bullet when it comes to every single policy decision. That's not how we intend to present ourselves. But I think reading scripture and reading Archbishop Coke's letter, it's good to be challenged. Like when we do think about these matters, what's my default sort of like, um, you know, who do I, who do I kind of side with? I think these words from James are challenging for a lot of us living in this economy and living in this country. But I actually do have the policies because I'm running for, no, I'm kidding. I'm not running for Senate. No, uh, but I think that's right. Like what we want is, okay, what are the, what are the solutions and going forward, it's interesting, this last part of this letter about going forward. And one more time, Archbishop Coakley, known for loving like the traditional mass, known for being a traditional uh, archbishop, he's not, like you said, siding with this sort of uh, political party, this idea about like one phase of the church. This is the perennial teaching. Yeah. He's quoting James. And when we talk about going forward, he's not saying vote this way, do these things. He's saying... Are we with the poor or not? And if you can't think of any sort of way that you're even figuratively with the poor, that's the condemnation. So one of the first things he says we need to practically do, quote, let us pray for those who've died, their loved ones, those who are ill, those who have lost their jobs before an end of this crisis. We're close to the poor and the dead through prayer. Yeah. But furthermore, he goes, finally, let us engage in building a better kind of politics by entering into dialogue with elected officials, calling them to an authentic par- politics that is rooted in the dignity of the human person and promotes the common good. But, but I think finally, this is like we can, you know, we've got a few minutes to ruminate on this. The pandemic, he says, has universally presented us with many shared experiences, 
May we build on this moment with a global fraternity that transcends partisanship and eradicates injustices in all forms. But that's it, as if going forward, if w the problem has been we've been distant from the poor, and so we can't really speak for them and we forget them, the pandemic has laid us all low, bud. Now, some far more than others. Like, there's no sort of idea about an equality of how we all faced this. But we did face this together, at least in some way. And Archbishop Coakley's begging us, along with Pope Francis, to say, this common experience, is this going to allow us to have a fraternity with the poor, finally, because we shared this traumatic experience together? Yeah, when we, uh, again, when we taught together, I, when you say just like, in some ways trying to identify or live in solidarity, like a huge step for our students is the college is located uh, 6th Avenue near 235. And of course, like right around the college, there are some felt needs. And, you know, one way we sort of nudged the students out of their nest was to say, like, you don't have to solve the needs, but you have to, you have to try to see them. And I think that self-awareness can be unsettling, but... um we do have to ask ourselves, have, have I organized my life in such a way that I'm, I'm even blind to the cries of the poor that St. James and Archbishop Coakley both ask us to hear? And it doesn't have to be like you're purposefully doing that. That's, this is what pastors do is they ask you, are there ways that you're not even meaning to do this? Yeah. And that's a way to go forward. So this is the uncommon good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, our family, our city, our state, our nation, the globe, solar system, the whole caboodle. This is the uncommon good. But what are ways that people can join prayer life here on Iowa Catholic Radio? Yeah, please pray the rosary uh, daily with us at 5.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. You can always also um, hear the rosary on Iowa Catholic Radio's app anytime, anywhere. Uh, we also broadcast the Angelus on air at 5.55 a.m. and 11.55 a.m. And then the Divine Mercy Chaplet right uh, five minutes before 3 p.m. Well, on iowacatholicradio.com, we have all of the events that are coming up, so you can check those out there. The Man Up Power, uh, the Man Up West Power Lunch is back Friday, September 10th at noon. That's St. Francis of Assisi Parish in West Des Moines. Iowa Catholic Radio Fall Carathon starts September 20th. Please consider giving a gift of $30 a month to continue our mission and connecting listeners to Christ. You can give now at iowacatholicradio.com, and thank you for supporting Iowa Catholic Radio. Finally, the Women's Conference is Saturday, October 30th at the Embassy Suites downtown Des Moines with Dr. Kathleen Beckman, Barbara Heil, and Tim Jamison discussing the ongoing spiritual war in today's world. Doors open at 7, Rosary starts at 7.30 a.m., Mass at 8 a.m., and the conference starts in earnest by not at 9 and ends at 5 p.m. Bud, uh, prayers, everybody, uh, we're, we're looking forward to you helping us out with Spring Carathon. This is the Uncommon Good. Bob Honor, Dr. Bud Barn, we'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.